Hi, uh, good morning, everybody. Ready? Uh, before I we start the lecture, uh, I'd like to introduce myself. I think you saw me earlier. I can introduce myself again. My name is uh, John Asubolia, and uh, I'm a graduate student for uh, Master's of uh, Science in Nursing and Education. So I chose. Uh, I'm sorry. How you can hear me? I'm sorry. Sorry about it. Microphone problem. So uh, I'm going back. Uh, I'm a practicum student here, and I chose RBCC to be my practicum site. I'd like to warn you also that this is being recorded right now, but none of you will be seeing it recording. It's mostly me. It's part of my uh, course. Okay, and uh, a brief background uh, about myself before I start. Um, I've been a nurse for almost 26 years. I started when I was five years old. Uh, I've been uh, in a lot of places. I've worked a lot of places, and uh, from nursing homes to hospitals, med surge, of course. And uh, now I'm working in the operating room. I've been an operating room nurse for almost uh, 16 years. And now I'm uh, working as a registered nurse first assist. The so registered nurse first assist, we actually assist the doctors in uh, the performance of the surgery. So I guess our next topic will be uh, the care for the surgical patients, which a little background about that. So before we start, do you have any questions? Any complaints? We can have Mr. Elliott. Do the lecture if you don't want me doing it. So you can hear me in the back, right? Okay. okay. Yes. Those were uh, nurse initials. You guys can see the PowerPoint, right? Yeah? Okay. Uh, surgical patient. So, well, you had surgery here. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so, you know the feeling of being a patient, right? You, uh, you come in the uh, hospital, you, you get a little nervous. Were you nervous when you had your first surgery? Some of you, most of you, some of you are not. But uh, it's mostly fear of that and all. You don't know what's going to happen, right? What's going to be the surgery, end up, uh, how the surgery will end up, or is the anesthesia, uh, anesthesia medication going to work well with you? Also, the fear of death. It's, it's, Sleeping, you have no control. Okay, uh, we will be discussing uh, the care of the surgical patient. That's you who had surgery. So, perioperative care is what we call the um, care given to a patient uh, before, during, and after surgery. So, three phases of uh, uh, perioper perioperative care, namely. Pre-operative, which is before surgery, intraoperative, which is during surgery, and post-operative, uh, easily conclude after surgery. If you have any questions, just feel free to interrupt. So uh, let's start off with the uh, goals of uh, caring for a surgical patient. So our goals would be. Uh, Recovery from anesthesia after surgery. So uh, the patient recovers, uh, will be loaded up with anesthetic medications during surgery so they won't be able to feel anything or uh, feel any pain or discomfort uh, during the surgery. So recovery from those uh, medications is one of our goals in uh, caring for a surgical patient. Another one would maintain all the body functions patient had before surgery. So unless it's related to the um, particular surgery itself, all the other systems of the body should uh, be the same as before he had that uh, operation. Next goal would be to prevent post-operative complications. From surgery, the patient will undergo a lot of stress and there will be a possibility of complications arising from the patient going um, to, uh, through the surgery. 
Another goal will be is to prevent discomfort, uh, like providing adequate pain relief. So one of the major uh, problems that the patient will face during surgery would be uh, pain. So we cut you up, you cut yourself up, you'll feel uh, all, uh, pain around the wound. So one of uh, the goals in carrying a surgical patient is to lower pain as much as possible. So the, the less pain, uh, the better. And zero pain will be ideal. Next would be return to activities of daily living. So unless you had, um, they, you had an amputation or um, some uh, sur surgery that uh, debilitate, debilitates you, uh, one goal would be returning to activities of daily living as fast as possible, like walking, you know, caring for yourself. Okay? Okay, let's move on to the next slide. So, we have discussed the, uh, the different uh, phases of uh, surgery, I mean, inter uh, perioperative care. First uh, part of the intraoperative care is uh, preoperative care. So, uh, those who went to surgery, you didn't go to the operating room right away, right? Is that correct? Yeah, so most of you went to a room where uh, the nurse, uh, group of people asked you questions, did assessments on you, and this place where you change your clothes, that's called the holding or preoperative uh, area. So in the preoperative area, uh, is where the patient screen. So screening meaning uh, the uh, patient is uh, checked, um, assessed, or the history and physical is taken, so questions are asked, family history, social history, and this is for the area where the patient is also prepared. So it's imperative uh, for a patient going into surgery that, uh, uh, can you hold a minute please? Checking my video. <laughs> okay. okay, let's go back. So preoperative, so the patient uh, comes in, they change the clothes, the patient will be asked questions. Also, aside from uh, screening the patient, the patient will be prepared for surgery. Meaning, uh, they have to remove all jewelry, all uh, clothes, outside clothes will be changed to the patient gown. Uh, make sure that the patient uh, has a uh, not eaten the night before, so that's what the term you call NPO. Do you know what NPO means now? So it's at least 12, uh, 12 hours prior to surgery. So most of uh, the patients who go into surgery then, uh, tomorrow will stop eating or drinking midnight. So NPO post midnight. So the last meal or the last drink will be before 12 midnight. So that's called NPO. Uh, another uh, another um, activity done in the PR area is teaching. So you thought that uh, teaching is only done after, but any uh, thing about uh, recovery, returning to activities of daily living, uh, expectations will be taught prior to the surgery. So the patient already has that knowledge of what to expect once the sur uh, surgery is done. Uh, like deep breathing, um, uh, ex exercises, this, these will be taught uh, uh, prior to the surgery. So the patient has, uh, the more the patient knows, uh, the less anxiety uh, that will be felt by the patient uh, prior to surgery. Next will be, after all that, now the patient will be admitted to the operating room. So um, this is also the part where uh, the anesthesiologist does their interview, the consents will be checked. So the pre uh, the, the, they have what they call a pre-op checklist. Uh, the pre-op checklist will show that everything has been done, all the I's have been dotted, T's have been crossed, uh, consents were signed, H&P, patient's history. It's so all of these, like medications that the patient are uh, taking, all of these will be 
uh, will affect the outcome or uh, the procedure itself, the outcome of the surgery, or um, will affect how the patient will react to anesthesia, how the patient will react to uh, certain uh, stressful situations during surgery. So these has to be all screened out. Uh, it's called uh, the pre-op uh, checklist. So after uh, all this has been done, the IV is started by anesthesiologist. The patient will now be rolled into the operating room. So this is called the intraoperative part of the uh, stage of the perioperative care. It's where uh, most uh, it's where the part where I usually don't come in. We are the uh, intraoperative nurses, or, or what commonly known as operating room nurses. So we are in charge of the intraoperative care of the patient. Uh, we're not limited only in the intraoperative area or the operating room. We meet the patient uh, prior to the procedure. You introduce yourself, tell them what you're doing. Uh, usually it's the circulating nurse that does that. So we call it the circulating nurse. So they interview the patient. So aside from, they have to check if all the paperwork have been uh, uh, done. The preoperative checklist will guide them on how, uh, if all the uh, proper uh, paperwork, all the pro proper uh, histories have been taken. And most importantly, they make sure that the consents are, the consent is understood and signed by the patient. Not only signed by the patient, but understood. And also, uh, the history and physical of the patient is updated in front. Okay, so, uh, so that's also part of the responsibility of the circulating nurse, or what you call the interoperative. So, in, uh, once the patient gets rolled up, the surgery is done. Uh, the, after the surgery, the, <coughs> the next part of the, uh, the uh, phase of the care would be the uh, post-operative care. So, post-operative care, uh, the immediate uh, care given to a patient uh, recovering from surgery and especially recovering from anesthesia. Those anesthetic medications, uh, they do, they, uh, they stress out the body a lot because uh, the purpose of it is to uh, medicate you so you won't uh, be able to um, feel anything or uh, feel anything during uh, the surgical procedure. So some uh, areas uh, for example, uh, patients getting uh, general anesthesia. So you have different kinds of anesthesia. You have the local anesthesia and general anesthesia. And also sedation. Uh, most general anesthesia patients, they will be uh, built into what we call a uh, post-anesthesia care unit. So it's, uh, the patients who have received, like, uh, who are intubated and got um, uh, uh, the um, anesthetic gases, which uh, goes throughout the body. It takes time for these anesthesia gases to dissipate or uh, to be uh, uh, get uh, rid by the body. So it, it, the, it's critical that after surgery, these patients are closely monitored, their vital signs are checked every five minutes, and uh, their consciousness are checked That's also every five minutes to make sure that the patients are recovering well from it. Uh, general anesthesia. For a local anesthesia, where you have your what you call your novocaine, we call it lidocaine in the operating room. Uh, patient just gets um, like some IV drugs to calm them down, but uh, most of the procedure they'll be awake. So they uh, go to a place called the recovery and the ambulatory uh, surgery uh, to uh, or the phase two of the. Uh, uh, post-operative care. First, for general anesthesia patients, they have to go through the phase one, which is immediate post-operative care. And once they recover from immediate post-operative care, they go to phase two, which is ambulatory care. Uh, ambulatory care meaning the patient's awake, uh, they, they can uh, walk to the bathroom, back and forth in the back the bathroom, uh, alert four into times three. So this is, uh, some patients go direct to phase two, but uh, most General anesthesia patients go to phase one. And uh, some, yes.
uh, yeah, alert oriented, time streaming, uh, time free, uh, time, place, and person. You're alerted to place and person. Yeah, sure. Usually, when patients come out to recovery, they have general anesthesia. The one thing that they look for in the head of the pillow, in other words, can you maintain your airway? That's what they want to look for. Are you alert? Yes. Well, they'll speak to you. Next to this, you please raise your head off the pillow. They want to know if you can maintain your airway. If you're getting a local, that is fine, it's like a duo, and it starts to wear off. The one thing they want to see is when you move your feet from you. At that point, you need to be cleared and then they'll take it from there. Okay? Does that help? It, it depends. If you can, if everybody goes to happy, what's that procedure? Everybody goes. Okay? It just depends on where you are. In. If you've you been intubated and in general, a lot of patients come out awake, intubated, and extubated rather, and alert. A little broad, but that's okay. All right? Again, before they send you anywhere, you look at the health of the world. They will probably put you on oxygen, they can leave you, they can move on. Okay? And you're still getting the same pain medication you receive in the old one. That's what they send you. Yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. Impact is, you want to tell me who's in charge of the position? Impact is, who's in charge? That's what in charge. Who's that in charge? Yeah, oh. The anesthesiologist will be in charge since they're the ones who are in patients. The surgeon will do the surgery, but the, it's the anesthesiologist who puts the patient to sleep, gives all the anesthetic medications. So all the orders that will be given will be given by the an, an, anesthesiologist or the nurse anesthetist. So the nurse anesthetist also give all those drugs but under the supervision of the anesthesiologist. But they basically do all the same things, like uh, an anesthesiologist, but legally they should be under the uh, guidance or supervision of an anesthesiologist. So an anesthesiologist is a kind of physician who gives and provides anesthesia, which is the main medication given during surgery or procedures. Yeah, all the same. And by the way, the chief nurse anesthetist at Rockford so that's one of your pathways of going to, uh, yeah, to go to nursing. So there's a lot of, you know, it's a very, uh, a lot of uh, occupations and a lot of ways to uh, improve your career as a nurse. So going back, so uh, the patient, uh, so we have two phases: of phase one, phase two, and finally phase three. The patient's ready to go home, or the patient goes up to their their hospital. So phase one, patient still groggy, cannot drink. The, the main thing is the patient is the patient able to swallow. Because phase one, patient's awake, you wake them up, they ask you questions, but they're still a little groggy. But when you give them uh, like a glass of water, they start choking, so that's not a good idea. So make sure the patient's, to, in order to uh, proceed to phase two, the patient will have to uh, be able to uh, be more awake and be able to take sips of it. That's when uh, patient uh, nurses uh, assess, see if the patients can uh, take sips of water, and that's uh, an indication that the patient will be able to proceed to phase two. Okay, yes? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, when, uh, that's, you're, in, you're already in the second phase, right? You're awake, you're walking around. So, uh, one of the uh, things that, like, as I uh, discussed, is to go back to your normal body, body functions. So, um, uh, the anesthesia, anesthesia or the procedure itself will have effects on your different system, like your urinaries. Sometimes uh, you have a uh, problem with retention, then that's a complication arising from uh, surgery or a complication arising from uh, receiving anesthesia. So they want to make sure before you go home that all your normal body functions are you breathe, you drink, you walk, and go to the bathroom. So they want to make sure that everything's uh, normal before you go back to... Yes, yes, sure, no, no problem. Yeah, just feel free. Uh, 
They want yes, they want to be right. They want to make sure that you go back where you are. We had a young kid when I worked with the ER in Somerset. He came in, they had surgery the day before. The nurse asked him and he said this. He came and complained of pain in his lap and he walked to the bathroom the day before. Went ahead. He said he went to the bathroom. He said, did anybody go with you? He said, no. They asked him though, did you pee? He said, yeah. He said, how much? He was a couple of drops. He came in in pain. He barely walked. We emptied him of 1,500. That's why they want to make sure you do nothing. Where we go to make sure everything's normal. Sometimes uh, patients go home, they still have an IV and a test to them. So before you send the patient home, we make sure everything is before uh, they'll be able to uh, take care of themselves. For the kids, for kids, they'll be able to walk around more living. Any more questions? Before I proceed? Okay, next part, so we're done with, uh, the next part would be surgical consent. It, it is a document that is very important for surgery. So when you have surgery or you're working on the perioperative area, the operative area, most important document is the surgical consent. So surgical consent. So uh, let's go through this. Uh, uh, the patient must be given an informed consent prior to surgical procedure. What does it mean to be informed? You know what uh, having an informed consent means? Yes. Yes, they're aware of the risk and benefits. They know what the procedure, what they're in for. They make sure that everything's okay. Instead of you have a problem with your right leg, but the consent says, Less big. So, those are the things you have to watch out for. Uh, the informed consent, make sure that the patient understand uh, what the procedure is. We have instances where, especially for patients with uh, second language, when you ask them, they'll just say yes, yes, and when you go through an interpreter, they'll say, like, that's not, I, I, I didn't come in for that, but when you, like, Ask them, is this what we're doing? So it's yes, yes, yes. But on further investigation, now they're, they're not in for that particular procedure. So this is the most uh, important, uh, one of the most important, if not the most important uh, document during surgery, is the surgical consent. So um, uh, the patient must be informed, must be aware of uh, the surgery. It must be specific. Wording must be specific. With the exception of uh, situations where the patient is unable to sign uh, like a life-threatening emergency like they, uh, from the ambulance uh, or EMTs here, they go to the OR and there's no uh, family or the patient is unconscious. That's one of the exceptions that patient uh, cannot sign the consent. And, uh, but they do what they call an administrative consent. So they call the administration of the hospital. Um, they rule out that there's no family members around patient is unconscious, patient has, needs life-saving surgery, stop the bleeding or um, take care of uh, the swelling of the brain. Uh, administrative consent is done. So this is done by the administration in, uh, in uh, cooperation with the uh, surgeon. So another uh, exception for patients not signing the consent, if the patient is a minor and the patient cannot sign for themselves because of uh, mental and uh, they won't be incapacitated in uh, understanding what the surgery is. So uh, if we go to like legal uh, patient, uh, patient's family who has uh, a power of attorney and signing consents or the next of kin, like the wife or uh, parent or children. What's the importance of the consent? So let's see. It's, consent is very important. Uh, first, to the it protects for the patient. It protects them from having any procedure procedure that he or she does not wish. So, what's written in the consent should be the procedure that is done during consent. If they do take out your um, um, take out your gallbladder, that's all they do. Even though they see like, hey, this is a 
like a weird mole on a patient's chest. Do we need to take that out? It's weird. It's very suspicious. You cannot do that. The surgeon can only do the procedure that the consent allows them to do. So uh, when you become, if you decide to become a OR nurse, this is one uh, very important document you need to review. Uh, they change the wordings into layman for the patient to understand. They do not use like if they use like high, uh, like uh, complicated medical terms. The surgeon has to explain those medical terms in layman terms for the patient to understand. This is done before the patient signs the consent. So this protects the patient. Next, it also protects the hospital and the personnel. So if the patient complains like, hey guys, I didn't ask for this thing to be done, but like, uh, but you signed the consent. So you approve and you're aware of what the procedure was. So the consent will also protect uh, the hospital personnel and the surgeon from any litigation if the patient said, uh, says that uh, they did not, you know, sign for it or ask for this procedure, procedure to be done. And finally, it's uh, part of the legal document. For any uh, legal cases, uh, the consent is considered a legal form. So just like any other uh, form, uh, legal forms like contracts, the consent is considered legal and binding in uh, the court of law. Okay, going on to consent. So the informed consent, the main uh, person who is responsible for the consent and obtaining the consent uh, from the patient is the surgeon or the physician doing the surgery. So the assistant surgeon cannot uh, obtain consent, nurses cannot obtain consent, certain facilities like uh, certain facilities do not allow uh, the uh, residents, medical, uh, surgical residents to obtain consent and anesthesiologists cannot uh, obtain informed uh, surgical consent. Anesthesiologists also have their own consent called the anesthesia consent. Some facilities uh, have a separate consent for anesthesia and also they obtain the uh, blood because uh, there are certain religions that not, does not allow uh, the use of blood. So do you know uh, what particular religion for uh, blood? It's very important when you work in the hospital. It's Jehovah's Witness. So. Uh, that's why the uh, blood consent was made because of certain religions not uh, allowing the use of blood or blood products. So it's the legal, uh, the informed consent is the legal bond between physician and the patient. It informs the patient of the nature of the procedure, the consequences, like what are the side effects, uh, and the possible complications. So like there's a possibility of complications like uh, infection, um, like the wound adhesions, uh, evisceration. There's a, uh, the physician will tell all the possible com uh, complications of patients prior to the procedure and the chances for success. So uh, they'll, they'll give you uh, based on uh, evidence from uh, studies. They don't just uh, take numbers off the uh, the, they just don't take numbers off uh, there and give it to you like, yeah, we'll go through this procedure, it's going to be a beautiful thing. They'll give you numbers that will tell you like, uh, chances for this is just an 80% chance of uh, having uh, a su successful surgery, 10% chance, so 1% chance of having infection. So these will all be presented by the surgeon. Uh, another would be, uh, so chances for an alternative treatment. So the, the, uh, the surgeon will uh, provide the patient that uh, aside from surgery, you'll have these alternative treatments and uh, non-surgical treatments, and this is how effective they are. So they'll, uh, they'll be giving you choices as a patient. The nurse's most important job is to be a witness. So most of uh, the witnesses would be a pre-operative nurse. They will witness. The family will be there, the patient will be signing. The nurse will be a witness to the patient's signature. So there will be a part of the surgical consent for witnesses and that's where uh, you as a nurse will be signing. 
So you'll be observing the explanation, the patient understood and agreed, and uh, the patient was not forced to sign uh, the informed consent. Like any legal document, nobody, nobody needs to be coerced into signing something. If the patient refuses, then uh, the surgery is canceled. Uh, you cannot go through surgery without any part, uh, any uh, consent. Even for patients who cannot sign for themselves, like uh, traumatic accidents, uh, you still need administrative consent. You cannot just proceed, in order to save the patient's life, proceed to the surgery and try to uh, save the patient's life without any consent. Consent needs to be done prior to surgery. And uh, the patient also has the right to change their mind or, or ask any more additional questions. It is your right as a patient to ask as many questions as you want to make you feel better. And the nurse must inform the patient if uh, has, uh, the patient has any doubts or any more questions after signing the consent. The, the nurse would have to inform the physician of uh, uh, the position of uh, any changes or any more questions. Okay? There are special considerations, uh, like I said earlier, uh, for informed consent. One is emergencies where patients cannot uh, sign the consent, so that's one. Another one is uh, for children 18 years old, so the legal age is uh, under 80, 18 years old. Um, parents would sign for them. So minors uh, will be, uh, parents would be responsible in signing for uh, the patient's uh, informed consent. So the, the, uh, the legal uh, age for signing your own consent is 18. Okay? So you have to be aware of that. And also legal guardians of unconscious patients. So patients who uh, are uh, like had certain uh, the, uh, disabilities. Uh, it is the even though they are of legal age, uh, it is the uh, responsibility of the legal guardians or power of attorney to sign for these consents. Uh, emancipated minors, uh, you still need a guardian to sign for them. They cannot sign for their own consent. Um, and uh, sometimes it's. Uh, the social services will probably help out in uh, helping these uh, emancipated minors from uh, in signing their own, uh, going through the surgical procedure and signing consent. Another exception would be operative consent must be signed before. Uh, okay, another thing you have to uh, watch out for is once a patient is given any medications, narcotics that will alter the patient's uh, decision making then you cannot sign the consent. So all consents must be signed before medications will be given. So the anesthesiologist has to be aware, make sure that the consent, consents were signed before uh, giving any drowsy medica, like medication to make them drowsy, like narcotics or any medication to calm them down. Okay, any more questions? Any questions? So we we'll see uh, for the purpose of the consent, so the purpose of the consent is to inform patient and family to expect uh, what to expect during the procedure. Uh, I'm sorry, we're going to not consent, but preoperative teaching. Let's uh, go forward to preoperative teaching. So again, uh, preoperative teaching, uh, all the teachings is to be given uh, uh, during prior to surgery. Uh, whatever uh, surgery you do, if the patient's awake and alert and did not take any medications, this is when you give uh, the teachings. You won't be able to give the teachings once the patient comes out of anesthesia because they'll be groggy and uh, they won't understand the thing that you, you be saying, uh, giving them like paragraphs and par paragraphs of instructions, this will just go in and out uh, of the patients here. Just like now, you're like under anesthesia. So I try to give as much information, maybe at least 5% of what information I'm giving will be retained by you guys. So uh, I'll do is to reiterate uh, most of the questions asked during uh, uh, certain tests. So just remember the important parts. And if you have any doubts or any questions, just, just uh, interrupt me and ask questions. 
So preoperative teaching, what is the purpose of preoperative teaching? To inform the patient and family what to expect regarding the procedure. So they'll be asking, say, uh, the patient's going for a uh, cholecystectomy. Uh, what's the purpose of the cholecystectomy? Why, why, why am I here? So maybe the patient's been complaining of pain. Your severe pain comes with uh, cholecystitis. So the main diagnosis for cholecystectomy is cholecystitis. So they come over to the physician, the physician says, no, uh, the, uh, the main uh, treatment for this is surgery. So they remove, uh, do you know what uh, they remove in a cholecystectomy? Yes. The gallbladder, yes. It's one of the most common uh, procedures. But they do it laparoscopically now. You, they used to do it open, they cut up your belly like a seven inch cut. But now it's laparoscopic, meaning they do it with cameras. So you have like four little holes where so they are abdominal area and they can do the surgery from there. As opposed to getting like a seven inch cut across your abdominal area. So another um, um, purpose for preoperative teaching is to prepare the patient for the procedure. Prepare the patient mentally, physically, so that uh, to remove any doubts, so they'll be less nervous and more, more calm. A nervous patient going to surgery, you'll have more complications during and after surgery. So the patient's less anxious, less nervous then. Um, it'll prepare them more and make them uh, um, better uh, outcomes uh, for surgery. Another uh, purpose for the preoperative teaching is to reduce the patient's uh, uh, fears, patient and the family's fears. So as a surgical patient, a lot of you went through it. Some of you were very afraid of what to expect. So um, your job as a nurse to, uh, in preoperative teaching is to make the patient uh, less anxious, tell them what to expect. So it's mostly the fear of unknown. So it's not only the nurses, but also the um, anesthesiologists will, tell, uh, will be giving preoperative teachings regarding the effects of anesthesia. So what's the value of uh, preoperative teaching? It's very valuable as a nurse uh, and for the patient. This is to assist the patient to recuperate faster, recover faster from anesthesia. If you know what to expect. And you're giving preoperative teachings like what to do if you have, like, say, abdominal surgery. One of the complications is pneumonia. So they teach you how to cough uh, the right way, so to expectorate, so um, there's no uh, accumulation of fluids in your lungs. This, uh, if you were given the proper instructions prior to surgery, then when you uh, recover from surgery, you'll know what to do. Uh, another one would be to decrease the amount of medication the patient needs uh, post-operatively. So the more anxious you are, the more medications they need to calm you down. So, uh, uh, if you uh, are giving the proper preoperative teaching and you're more calmed down, then the, there's uh, less need for uh, for anesthetic medications to uh, make you more calm down and make you more groggy and makes your recovery time longer. And uh, if you have uh, less recovery time, then you have a decrease in the length of stay. So, uh, preoperative teaching is uh, very vital in uh, making your uh, surgical experience much shorter and better. Next would be the, uh, what are the parts of the preoperative teaching? First is uh, preoperative screening. There's uh, preoperative screening meaning there's a complete uh, physical examination. This includes lab works, blood works, vital signs, any uh, procedures like x-rays and CAT scans. This will screen out if you have any uh, conditions that would uh, hinder surgery or make surgery more dangerous, like if you have an unknown heart condition. When a patient once, we ask him, uh, did he do any drugs in front of his mom? And he said, no, I never did any drugs. So once we wheeled him in, and he said, like, did you do any drugs? Yeah, but I stopped like three years, three years ago. So once we were in the room, you know what? Uh, we warned him like certain uh, anesthetic medications uh, 
have uh, interactions with drugs. Oh, I, I just stopped like three days ago. Then, when he was in the orbit, like, you know what, uh, I stopped yesterday at three. So, we had to stop surgery because certain uh, drugs, uh, uh, like cocaine, will have a devastating effect once they're mixed with, um, with anesthesia medication. So it's very important, not only like uh, legal medications that you take, but also recreational drugs that the patients take. These will have devastating effects once combined with anesthesia. Uh, they had this famous case, but it's not an ORC case. Uh, I'm not sure if I like remember the Libby Zion case. So they did not, uh, this uh, it's a daughter of a wealthy publisher, which she was in the ER, and uh, they tried to revive her, but did not uh, ask her what uh, medications or recreational drugs she was taking. So when they tried to save her life to, by giving her drugs, uh, the drugs ended up killing her. So, uh, and they blamed it on the uh, resident physician who was uh, on call or uh, for like 24 hours during that time. So that's called the Libby Zion Law where residents or even probably nurses are not allowed to work more than 16 hours during the day. They're still there. And you ask them, well, wait a minute, you're not supposed to be here. Oh, we're following up. <laughs> so it's, um, it's, it's, it's a balancing act you have to do. Surgeon cabinet, surgeon cabinet mentality. I've been put through this, you're going through it. So, another uh, part of the preoperative teaching is diet. Certain procedures, like abdominal procedures, where they have, um, they go through the uh, small bowel and uh, large bowel procedures uh, for your GI tract, uh, they will uh, tell you what diet uh, regimen you be follow. You just don't start, once you wake up, you don't start going to regular solid foods right away. So after surgery, you go from clear liquids, then from clear liquids like water, then soup, then you have thicker liquids, once you tolerate clear liquids, then that's when uh, the, the surgeon or the physician will uh, deem, it, uh, deem it okay for you to proceed to regular solid food. So it's uh, for abdominal surgery where it involves GI, you just don't go to, uh, to regular food right away. So you, you start with uh, clear liquids. Next would be uh, the operating room and uh, recovery room, what to expect uh, when you're in those areas. Another would be, like what I said earlier, is coughing and deep breathing. This will prevent you from developing pneumonia. So one of the challenges for uh, post-operative care is pneumonia. If the patient doesn't move around and is bedridden most of the time after surgery and does not cough, uh, practice coughing, there would be an accumulation of fluid in the lungs, and this would lead to a complication called uh, post-surgical pneumonia. Another will be the care of the incision site uh, post-operatively. So they'll tell you what to expect. For ex uh, example, you have certain procedures. Let's go back to that fully. If you have little, you'll be expecting little uh, incisions that are covered either by uh, plastic or what you call dermabond. Uh, you know what dermabond is? You know that liquid uh, like crazy glue? It's, it's actually clay crazy glue but like five times more expensive because it's medical, yeah, medical sterilized. So that's what dermabond is. It's crazy glue. Uh, keep your skin edges together when they heal. Another would be uh, effects of anesthesia and your activity levels. Uh, after the procedure. Uh, one example of activity level would be once uh, you have surgeries called total knee procedures where they replace your uh, knee joints because they're, uh, it's uh, been deteriorated through time. They replace this, then the, 
the knees with uh, metal implants. So after that, it is one of the most painful procedures. You won't be able to walk, but they have a uh, physical therapy regimen that you need to follow after surgery, which they would give you prior to the uh, entering the OR. So we understand uh, what to expect and what to do after surgery. So you can recover as quickly as possible. Okay, any questions to uh, about uh, preoperative teaching? Nope. And next uh, part of the uh, lecture would be the types of surgery. This will be seen in your uh, page uh, 1262 in your textbook, table 50.1. Uh, we'll run through the different types. You have the uh, curative, the palliative, exploratory, reconstruct reconstructive, and uh, emergency. So let's uh, discuss the first part, curative. So uh, we do surgical procedures to cure particular ailments like Say you have cholecystitis, what do we do? Cholecystectomy. So we remove the gallbladder. If you have problems with your uh, tonsils, having chronic tonsillitis, what do you do? Tonsillectomy. Okay. So those are the certain procedures, uh, depends on diagnosis. They, they, uh, the type of surgery would uh, is done to cure a particular condition. Certain cancers can be cured through HIV. Breast cancer, but you know, uh, once you take it at the right time, you see it has a lot of stages, then uh, you will be uh, uh, you will be able to treat that particular condi uh, condition through surgery. So another one would be appendicitis, according to our uh, uh, slide here. So what you do is an appendectomy. Okay. Next would be palliative. What does it mean to be palliative? This is done to relieve uh, symptoms, like say, for pain relief. They have something what they call a sympathectomy. They, uh, they cut off nerve endings so you won't be able to feel pain. So this is done uh, for cancer patients, to relieve them of their pain. Uh, they won't be able to treat the cancer, but please make your life more um, pain-free and more comfortable. So that's what they do when you do palliative. You don't uh, cure anything, but you take care of the symptoms of the uh, disease. Uh, another way is uh, called debulking uh, for cancer. You don't cure the cancer itself, but uh, the tumor you take off so the other organs will be able to function normally. Next would be exploratory. This is done the one uh, usually done for emergent procedures, uh, exploratory. You explore around. They uh, have a uh, midline incision. They open up the belly and see what's, uh, what seems to be the problem. Like if you have abdominal pain that won't be relieved through uh, medical procedures, the uh, the final option would be surgery to see what uh, is ailing the patient. Next would be reconstructive. This is uh, what you call your uh, Plastic surgery is that a reconstructive surgery. If you want uh, to make your belly smaller and your boobs bigger, that's small. Or take your tissues from your belly and put your boobs if possible. That's what they, uh, we can, they call it reconstruction. Um, uh, the, um, for the breast enhancement, they call it breast enhancement surgery. So it's uh, pretty common too. Uh, you also have breast reduction, those are reconstructive surgery. So patients who had like uh, burn, burn problems, uh, most uh, reconstructive surgery is done by uh, plastic surgeons. And also, not only for aesthetic or beauty purposes, reconstructive surgery is also for functional. So certain uh, procedures, uh, if you have problems with, uh, um, say, your kidneys or your ureters, have a little blockage, they reconstruct your ureter so it, it will be uh, the flow of urine from your kidneys to your bladder will be normal. So that's one example example of reconstructive surgery, not just uh, plastic surgery that we see on TV. Uh, certain reconstructive surgery also will correct the functions of certain systems or certain organs. And uh, finally you have the emergency surgery. So they um, 
take care of life-threatening problems. Like, say, if you can't breathe, they do a procedure called a tracheostomy. So those are the, uh, the things that you saw in the dolls. Those are uh, uh, tracheostomies. Since there's a uh, blockage in the upper part of the respiratory system where the patient cannot breathe, the emergency, uh, the emergency surgery done is called a tra tracheostomy. You put a hole down here, trachea. Okay, those are the, the different types of surgeries uh, that will be encountered uh, when you come in the uh, uh, perioperative uh, area. Okay, do we get a five minute break uh, to wake you up a little bit? I know I, I'm a good anesthesiologist. Most of you have been uh, sleeping, so uh, thank you very much for enduring the first hour of the lecture. And uh, I'll, I'll be around if you have any questions. Yes? Yes, uh, yeah, that's one of the complications of being elderly. So in surgery, prior to surgery, uh, the thing that you uh, watch out for are the extremes. The very young and the very old and the very sick. <laughs> You're not old though. No. <laughs> 70 is not old. That's the new 50. There you go. <laughs> so yeah, especially for el elderly patients, uh, it's very hard because all your organs are all you know, slowing down, so your reaction and recovery from anesthesia is worse. I mean, it's not as uh, optimal as like uh, young adults like Elliot. <laughs> Any more questions? Uh, if you're curious about uh, surgery, anything that comes out for the test? No? You understand what a surgical consent is? It's very important. So when you go to the OR, I'm not sure if you, uh, yes. Yeah, I'll say emancipated minors. Uh, I'm not sure. That's a tricky situation because uh, they're not old enough to understand the reason why they're minors. The reason why they're not voting, they do not have that decision making capacity. In other words, when you try to say it, they may be or social services. Social services. That is the case. Yeah. Yeah. They're free from uh, legal responsibility, right? So uh, this is just to protect you. You cannot just ask, ask a minor. It's going to be a legal problem. Ah, oh, would you do this? Would you uh, do breast enhancement on a 16-year-old? Yeah. Anything, any questions uh, regarding uh, surgery? Okay, you get a piece of five minute break to rest your minds and wake up a little bit. Thank you, by the way. <laughs>